In the 1950s, video games were novelties. Due to the combination of high computer prices and limited basic knowledge, there was no real market for video games. They were made and distributed mostly in the programming and academic communities, for the purpose of either education or technical advancement. As the 1960s started, video games, while still extremely expensive, began to spread more. Space War, made by a few Harvard and MIT employees, was one of the first video games to ever be distributed for something other than an academic or technical purpose. However, it was made on the PDP-1, a computer which at the time costed $120,000 and sold only 55 units, mostly to academic institutions. As you can imagine, Space War didn't really make it to an audience beyond the academics using those 55 computers. It did, however, inspire other programmers to make their own version and their own commercial games, including computer science pioneers such as John Kemeny and Ken Thompson. And this is where it all starts. The spread of video games in the 1970s was rapid. Some of the many advancements included the creation of the first arcade video games and the distribution of the wildly successful and influential game Pong. It was here that video games truly began making their mark on the world. It was here that marked the beginning of the console. Around the same time academic video games were still making their rounds, a man named Ralph H. Baer had an idea to create a game that attached to the television and was displayed there. After 20 years of idea making and prototyping, this console was released to the public in 1972, the same year Pong released. This console was the Magnavox Odyssey. While not a commercial success, the Magnavox Odyssey paved the way for the rest of the first ever generation of consoles, which included Home Pong by Atari, the Telstar by Coleco, and the Color TV game series by Nintendo. As the home console began to dominate, arcade machines such as Pong were becoming obsolete. Manufacturers sold machines at a loss just to clear inventory. This massive loss in the gaming market, on top of Pong copycats popping up everywhere, caused the first video game industry crash in 1977. This crash led to a loss of stability in the gaming industry, including companies like Fairchild and RCA abandoning their consoles completely. The two consoles made by those companies were technically the first consoles of the second generation of video games. However, due to the crash, this generation wouldn't really kick off until the third console that came out, the Atari 2600. Due to the combined efforts of games like Adventure, Pac-Man, and Space Invaders, the desaturation of Pong, and the elimination of its then-competitor Fairchild, the Atari 2600 was a massive success, restoring confidence to the video game market. This second generation of video games not only spawned extremely successful home consoles such as the Intellivision and the Odyssey 2, but it also saw the creation of the handheld gaming console. The games were exciting. The industry was booming. Everything was going great. Whoops, I had to jinx it, didn't I? Due to the extremely flooded console and game market, the poor quality of those games, the increasing popularity of home computers, rapid inflation, and the beginning of third-party developers, the gaming industry crashed. Hard. Magnavox dropped out of the video game business completely. The company iMagic left before even starting and liquidated themselves instead. Atari, having contributed to the poor quality of games, suffered massive losses which would eventually be the death of them. It wasn't the only factor, but it was a big part of it. Video game sales reduced from around $3 billion in 1982 to $100 million in 1985. The stability of the video game industry was once again questioned by many. The American dominance of the video game market was no longer. But of course, that wasn't the end. We are far from the end. As mentioned earlier, due to the crash of 83, American dominance in the video game market ended. However, that didn't mean it was the end of the video game market in general. At the same time of the crash of 83, Nintendo had just released the Famicom, a console that after jumping a few hurdles became insanely popular in Japan. Nintendo hoped to also get the console popular in North America. The name changed from Famicom to the Nintendo Advanced Video System to the Nintendo Entertainment System. Due to a variety of factors, such as its lockout technology, its approval system for third-party developers, its exclusivity rules, its adverse marketing, and many other things, the NES was a massive success and brought confidence back to the North American video game market. On the heels of the NES was another Japanese console looking to replicate Nintendo's success, the Sega Master System. While only selling a fraction of what the NES sold, 
The Master System was more powerful, had legendary games, dominated in Europe and South America, and built a strong fan base for Sega. This would lay the foundation for the console wars in the years to come. Atari also participated in the third gen, but between an archaic game lineup and Nintendo's lockout policy, they didn't do so hot. So what happened next? The fourth console generation started with the mouthful that was the NEC TurboGrafx-16 Entertainment Super System, even though it was none of those things. It did well in Japan, but not enough to completely rival the main players that were Sega and Nintendo in North America. The Sega Genesis was the first one of the two to come out. While not very successful in Japan, the Genesis rebranded itself as the cool console, placing itself as the better and more powerful of the two when compared to Nintendo. It wasn't as easy as that, however, as Nintendo was still dominating the market and had systems in place to make sure they didn't lose it. On top of this, just a few years after releasing the Genesis in the US, Nintendo released the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. It quickly dominated the Japanese market. Even though the Genesis came out first, the SNES and Genesis fought for years for dominance of the American and European markets. The Genesis used a lot of mudslinging tactics to brand themselves as the better console. Nintendo often lied about their sales in order to give them the appearance of winning the console war. Genesis games censored far less and used its power to its advantage, but Nintendo had a series of masterpieces on the SNES. The Genesis frequently outsold Nintendo during holiday seasons. The numbers as to who was winning were never clear. It wasn't until much later that the numbers proved the SNES as the highest selling console of the fourth generation, and even those numbers are highly debated. On the flip side of the home console was the handheld, whose data is not nearly as muddled as the home consoles. Many big hitters decided to try their hand at the handheld game. Nintendo, Sega, Atari, NEC, and these things. Due to a greater software library, lower price, better battery, and many other factors, the Nintendo Game Boy won in a landslide, selling over 100 million units. Nintendo was cruising. The next few generations would clearly be theirs, right? There's a ton of stuff that happens in this one, so let's get started. The FM Towns Marty, Amiga CD32, and 3DO all were the first 5th gen consoles released. The Amiga and Towns Marty came and went fast. The much hyped 3DO remained to compete against four video game giants. Who were they? First up was the Atari Jaguar. The 5th generation marked the beginning of CD use instead of cartridges as the main method of holding video game information. So the Jaguar releasing with cartridges after the CD-capable 3DO raised many eyebrows. On top of this, lack of third-party support and bit controversy all ended up making the Jaguar a massive financial failure for Atari. It was at this point that they dropped out of the video game market. Not permanently, though. Next up was Sega. They had the opposite problem as Atari. It wasn't that they weren't selling enough consoles, they were selling too much of their previous generation. At the beginning of the fifth generation, 16-bit consoles were still dominating the market. Sega didn't have the inventory to keep selling them. It didn't help that while Sega was releasing the Saturn in Japan, they were still introducing peripherals for the Genesis and promoting it everywhere else. On top of this, when the Sega was overtaken by PlayStation in Japan, they ordered the US branch to release the console early in order to gain an advantage on the rising PlayStation. While this surprise release was supposed to help Sega, it actually hindered them. Third-party developers were unprepared for an earlier release date, marketing was still very scarce, retailers were extremely upset and surprised, and of course there's the fact that Sony announced a lower price for the PlayStation right after this stunt. Throughout its run, the many issues holding the console back included the lack of a dedicated Sonic game, lack of company support, and strong competition from Nintendo and Sony. Sega ended up selling a fraction of what the two remaining consoles did. They would end up taking heavy losses that affected them greatly. Now let's get to the last two consoles. Following the SNES, the Japanese recession, the third party backlash, and the arrival of new competition, Nintendo had a lot of pressure on them when it came to maintaining their share of the video game market. A new format of information distribution was rising quickly in the form of the CD-ROM. A company called Sony offered to team up with Nintendo by making an attachment for the SNES, hoping to shoot into the video game industry themselves. However, the alliance between Sony and Nintendo was extremely rocky from the beginning, with general mistrust wafting through the air. 
Nintendo didn't want to help Sony find a way into the video game industry as they already dominated all the other markets. Nintendo secretly formed an alliance with Philips, hoping that they could achieve greatness with each other. We saw how that turned out. So what happened next? Well, during their sickening attempt to innovate their handheld lineup, Nintendo started working on Project Reality, the console that we know to be the Nintendo 64. Project Reality was a joint venture between Nintendo and SGI, who had also been turned down by Sega. The first truly 64-bit console, the Nintendo 64 was met with great anticipation, aside from the announced cartridge system. After multiple delays, the Nintendo 64 released, selling tens of millions of consoles. But for Nintendo, the amount it sold was low compared to previous systems. Its relatively late entry into the generation, plus the loss of third-party developers due to the cartridge-based system, hurt Nintendo a lot. But the thing that hurt them the most was the broken deal with Sony. After the rejection, Sony went to Sega, but Sega also said no. Sony went through a rough stretch with Nintendo, where there were many licensing disputes and lawsuits. After a failed attempt at patching things up with Nintendo, they decided they were just going to do it themselves. And they did. They scrapped the initial design for Nintendo and started over. Sony did things differently than the other companies. The PlayStation, previously PSX, was a 3D-focused console with disc-based system. Sony actively reached out to third-party developers, not only building a strong library of games, but laying a strong foundation of exclusive developers and companies that would help Sony throughout the years. Then came Sony's epic price reading at the 1995 E3. These things all contributed to the massive success of the PlayStation, Sony's monster of a console. It sold over 100 million units throughout its lifetime, quickly placing Sony as a major player in the video game market. It was so successful that it attracted another company to join the game. Personal computers were experiencing a boom in popularity at the same rate as video game consoles. One company called Microsoft was making significant waves with its Windows operating system. However, the success of the PlayStation led many developers to leave Windows for Sony's much-awaited next console. Microsoft decided they needed to enter the console race. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Big changes were happening at Sega in the late 90s. People in power were dropping like flies, and the mishandling of Sega's previous two consoles wasn't faring well for them. Sega needed this next console to be a hit. Instead of making it complex and expensive like the Saturn, Sega decided this next console would be as streamlined as possible. This console was also the first that included a modem for online playing. It launched with Sonic Adventure, the first 3D Sonic game. This console as you know it today is the Dreamcast, being critically praised as an amazing console and one of the best of all time. It had a very successful launch, but alas, it was not to last. Between poor manufacturing, loss of third-party support, and tough competition, Sega quickly found themselves taking massive losses again, ending up with them leaving the console game and focusing purely as a software creation company. The build-up to Sony's next console was incredible. After the mega hit that was the PlayStation, people were really anticipating great things from this console, and Sony intended to deliver. It was rumored to be equipped with backwards compatibility, a DVD player, and the ability to connect to the internet. Its unveiling demonstrated the stunning graphical capabilities of the console. The launch of the PlayStation 2 was incredibly successful, selling in its first day over double what the Dreamcast had sold. Its success led to the discontinuation of the Dreamcast, leaving the PlayStation 2 to be the only competitive console in the 6th gen for a decent stretch of time, helping them out even more. By the end of its impressive 13-year run, it had sold over 150 million consoles, making it the best-selling console of all time. So what machines had to match up to this beast? Nintendo was running away with the handheld market. It was almost unfair how much its new handheld, the Game Boy Advance, outsold the competition at the time. Nintendo's play with home consoles wasn't as steady, however. The Nintendo 64, while popular, drove many third-party developers away due to its cartridge system. They had also developed a mostly family-friendly reputation. This next console had to make up for that. The new console was codenamed Project Dolphin, and would integrate motion controls into its controllers. This feature, however, was postponed due to technical difficulties. The GameCube had a strong start, but overall fell behind the PlayStation and Microsoft's new console. Nintendo's remaining third-party games also sold less than on other consoles due to Nintendo's emphasis on first-party titles and the still-present family-friendly image. 
it was overall the third highest selling console of its generation. Now let's go back to Microsoft. After losing many developers to Sony's runaway success, Bill Gates and Microsoft decided to develop their own console. The console they were developing would hopefully stand as a real competitor to the PlayStation 2. Bill Gates attempted to form a partnership with Sega, but that fell apart. Microsoft did, however, end up buying Rare after Nintendo wouldn't, surprisingly. The Direct Xbox, soon to become Xbox, impressed consumers upon its initial announcement. The console itself ultimately was very powerful and successful due to its emphasis on internet connectivity and its genre-defining games. It was nowhere close to reaching the PlayStation 2's numbers, though. This generation's fate had been decided early on. Let's see if it stayed that way. As we delve into more recent generations, the events surrounding the consoles becomes more familiar and more detailed. Before the intense home console battle of Gen 7, the handhelds were making waves of their own. Nintendo had at this point decided to focus more on innovative ways to play rather than improving graphics and hardware. This was a big risk. Hiroshi Yamauchi, who had just recently stepped down as president of Nintendo, was quoted saying, If the DS succeeds, we will rise to heaven, but if it fails, we will sink to hell. The Nintendo DS fortunately was a massive success and throughout the lifespan of its three iterations managed to sell over 150 million devices, making it the best-selling handheld of all time and the second best-selling console in general, right behind the PlayStation 2. Speaking of the PlayStation 2, Sony had decided to try its hand at the Nintendo-dominated handheld market. This device was the most powerful handheld system up to that point. The console, called the PlayStation Portable, was extremely versatile, not only being a game console, but a platform to look at pictures, watch movies, and listen to music. It was the first handheld device to truly threaten Nintendo's reign. The PSP would end up selling over 80 million units, and while a far cry away from the Nintendo DS, it was still pretty darn good considering the competition that came before it. So now, on to the big stuff. The consoles. First off was Microsoft. The next Xbox was already being designed just two years after the release of the first one. This new Xbox, the Xbox 360, was an amalgam of different features, just like the PSP. It included the ability to stream music, TV, and movies, but most notably it did so over Xbox Live, the platform that had developed much more since its initial phase. The Xbox 360 and Xbox Live were lauded for moving forward online digital distribution as a gaming platform, cementing the role of online gaming, and adding achievements. The Xbox 360 was very successful outside of Japan, albeit it had a few problems at launch. Overall, it did well, selling over 80 million units and being the second highest selling console of the 7th generation. Sony did not fare so well. The PlayStation 3 was initially unveiled at E3 2005, where the main point of criticism was its strange boomerang-shaped controller. This would eventually be fixed, however the next year Sony stumbled again from an awkward E3 conference that ended in an astonishing announcement of the PlayStation 3 costing $600. Chief Xbox officer at the time, Robbie Bach, recalled that the room he was in went dead silent upon the hearing of this announcement, followed by intrigue and optimism at the opportunity this would provide them to gain a larger share of the market. The PlayStation 3 was able to bounce back well for a relatively successful launch. Kind of. It would, however, end up being the lowest selling console of the big three. Not by much, though. During Project Dolphin, the initial stage of the GameCube, Nintendo had begun developing motion controls, but saved them for a later generation as they couldn't be perfected in time. Their next console would continue the idea that Nintendo had in place with the Nintendo DS, change the style of gameplay and appeal to as many people as possible. The console was less powerful than its competitors, but with a purpose. Shigeru Miyamoto is quoted with saying, The consensus was that power isn't everything for a console. Too many powerful consoles can't coexist. It's like having only ferocious dinosaurs. They might fight and hasten their own extinction. The Wii, codenamed Revolution, was criticized for continuing to promote the kiddie and friendly brand that Nintendo had been gaining. The Wii, however, proved to be a massive success, breaking many sales records and beating the sales of the other two consoles in its gen by about 20 million units. Nintendo had proven that power wasn't everything when it came to home consoles, but would it stay that way? Nintendo, while finding success in catering to a wider audience, had reached the pinnacle of its family-friendly casual image. It was frequently called out on for this fact and was not taken as seriously as the other competitors, even though they did the same things. 
Nintendo decided that their next console would appeal to more core gamers. This new console would fix all the things that the Wii was criticized for. Its lack of HD, poor online connectivity, and weak hardware. The initial announcement for this new console, the Wii U, confused many. It was unclear what this was supposed to be. A sequel console? An upgrade console? A peripheral? After the announcement, the Nintendo stock had an unprecedented fall due to skepticism. The launch itself wasn't so hot either, as one of the console versions barely had enough storage in it for a game. The console had a weak lineup of launch games with only two true Nintendo exclusives and a smattering of ports. Sales were abysmal and many developers pulled their support. It would eventually have a few resurgences in popularity following the release of some of Nintendo's best titles, but it ultimately would end up in last place in this generation. By a lot. The Wii U had its North American release in between the other two consoles competing for the throne, and what an epic competition it would be. Because the release date for these consoles were so close, it all came down to the actual ability of the console, not just which came first. The Xbox One made a few blunders during its initial announcement, with the announcement of daily check-ins, a terribly used game policy, and a huge slap in the face to indie game developers. The PS4 did the exact opposite of these things, making them the more appealing of the two. That's not it, though. At E3, right after Xbox One's conference, the PS4 announced its console as being a whole $100 cheaper than the Xbox One. The PS4 had gained major traction. While both companies had a very weak launch lineup, the PS4 quickly amassed a mountain of good exclusives, whereas the Xbox One had some decent at best games which were never truly exclusives because they all got released on PC. This, combined with the fact that Sony already dominated in the Japanese market, meant that the PlayStation 4 practically ran away with the crown. As of today, it has sold over double what the Xbox One has. Sony also tried revamping their handheld line. The PSP, while not the winner of its race, was still a significant success, and it was time to cash in on it. This new portable device would have next-gen graphics and be almost as strong as a PS3. But no matter how impressive the technology, the handheld, named Vita, was going to have a tough time this generation. Its sales started out strong but quickly suffered due to its high price, high memory card price, immediate pulling of support, and lack of good launch games. Sony themselves would later be quoted that they did not believe handhelds to be a huge market opportunity, although the failure of the Vita was the fault of nobody but themselves. Developers began pulling their support, which further hurt the Vita. Specifically, Capcom pulled its Monster Hunter series, which had been so critical to the PSP's success. It was given to the Nintendo 3DS, the console the PS Vita would eventually succumb to. Speaking of the Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo had been working on stereoscopic 3D for a long time, with them already having achieved use of the technology itself as early as the Famicom. Nintendo decided to keep forging ahead with the idea of 3D and, well... Next was the GameCube, which was intended to have 3D viewing, and even had a game made for that purpose already, but the technology was too expensive to market it as such. So now we're here. After its initial announcement, the industry was extremely excited, with many pointing out the Nintendo 3DS was much more powerful than the Wii. The Nintendo 3DS sold extremely well, and is currently still selling, with continued support being announced for the console throughout 2018 and beyond. And that's it! That's all... Oh yeah, I guess there's one more. As the Wii U slowly died, Nintendo needed to switch up their business strategy. They couldn't succeed with the Wii U as their main console for another few years. This new console Nintendo was making, codenamed NX, had a lot of roles to fill. It needed to make the motion controls of the Wii more precise and less noticeable. It needed to attract more than just casual games, like the Wii U was supposed to do. It needed to gain the trust of third-party developers. It needed to sell badly. The console, now named the Nintendo Switch, was revealed in October of 2016 and advertised up through the months leading up to its release. There was a lot of mixed signals concerning the Switch. Many said that it was a gimmick. Its lack of power only proved Nintendo wasn't capable of making good consoles. It was only launching with five retail games. Nintendo's stock dropped quickly, twice, once after the release and once after the announcement of its specs. Despite all of this, however, the Switch was extremely successful, so far, becoming Nintendo's fastest-selling console and outselling the Wii U's life sales in one year. It hit a few bumps in its launch, however, most of them technical, but either way, it defied the odds. 
And it's at this point I bring the question, what are the odds? What are the factors that determine the success of a console? I ask this because as the console wars rage on, many consumers attribute success with power and specs. However, an interesting fact to note is that the most powerful console has never won its generation. The first and second gens are allowed passes, considering video games were still building momentum, although still the most powerful ones didn't win either in those two. As for the next generations, the Sega Master System was more powerful than the NES. The Sega Genesis was more powerful than the SNES. The N64, regardless of its lacking cartridge system, was more powerful than the PS1. The Xbox was a monster compared to the PlayStation 2. The Wii was a toy compared to its competition. And now we're at the 8th gen. Building on this fact, it's important to see that the defining factors between each generation have become more blurred with each iteration, to the point where the hardware is no longer the main determining factor. Take the Switch for example. Its technology puts it at the 7th generation, its release date puts it in the 8th generation, and its order in the Nintendo timeline puts it in the 9th generation. Some have begun reaching the conclusion that the concept of console generations as they were are now obsolete. The time has come to adapt a new set of ideologies when it comes to the future of video games. As technology advances, our concept of video games and video game consoles is going to change, as it did in the past. Video games have never been purely one thing. They are constantly evolving, changing with the world. Soon we will reach our limit with this current stage of video games, and like all of those before us, we will adapt to the next. We will find ways to keep pushing the medium forward, the same way that film has. This next change is going to be a big one. I can feel it. And I look forward to seeing what happens next.